On behalf of the Park Center for Independent Media, I'm the director, Jeff Cohen. Our speaker has already had a wonderful meeting earlier in the afternoon with some students. I think this kind of Ithaca turnout shows that we're a community that values independent journalists who are committed to accuracy and depth and social justice. You're going to get a chance to dialogue with our speaker as soon as the presentation is over. I now want to thank, though, before we get going, the entity that has made our center and this speaker series and our intern program possible, and that's the Park Foundation. Let's hear it for them. And a warm hello to our permanent Dean, new permanent dean of the, you know, this is one of those examples, where, one of these times where you say, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, and you're thrilled about it. The new permanent dean of the Park School of Communications, Diane Gajewski, stand up. She's been a strong supporter of the center all along. I want to quickly mention a few upcoming events and then turn it over to our speaker. Uh, get out your calendars or your handhelds. It's also a good time to turn off your cell phone ringers. I'm going to set a good example. Twelve days from today in this chamber, we will present Jeremy Scahill. investigative journalist, author of Blackwater, The Rise of the World's Most Powerful Mercenary Army. He will be receiving the second annual Izzy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Independent Media. That's the award named after the legendary Maverick journalist I.F. Izzy Stone. Mark your calendars Monday, April 19. Tomorrow, filmmaker Judy Richardson she worked on the Eyes on the Prize documentary. She'll be on campus with her newest documentary, Scarred Justice, The Orangeburg Massacre, 1968. It says something about racial blinders in our society that so many of us know so much about the killing of white college students at Kent State, and we know so little about the killing of black college students in Orangeburg, South Carolina, two years earlier. She will be screening that movie tomorrow at Texter at 4 and then speaking at 7. Finally, there's an ivory-colored uh, leaflet going around that derives from Beth Harris's class on war and occupation and displacement. These are student projects where they're bringing in journalists from Columbia who are experts, uh, an expert on paramilitaries and death squads. We have the journalist that was recently deported from Israel will be on campus. A series of events, a number of the events inspired by tonight's speaker. So what a thrill it is to bring on our speaker. Um, we've had some of the most august independent journalists on campus in these last couple years, but they speak, they talk about tonight's speaker in awe. They talk about her being in a league of her own. Author of the international bestseller, The Shock Doctrine, doctrine translated into 25 languages, including Arabic and Hebrew. Her first book, No Logo, Taking Aim at the Brand Bullies, also translated that one into more than 28 languages, inspired the global justice movement, inspired a new generation of activists challenging corporate greed. We all see her columns regularly in The Nation, in The Guardian, online. She co-produced the feature documentary, The Take, about workers occupying their closed factories in Argentina. You know, our center focuses on independent media voices that can offer us a deeper and more accurate, a more accurate narrative of recent events that's more accurate than what's typically available in corporate mainstream media. It's in that context that I proudly introduce Naomi Klein.
what a lovely crowd. And Jeff, what an honor to be introduced by you. I've been reading Jeff Cohen since I was an undergraduate, um, reading uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting's magazines and their trenchant media analysis. And it was a big part of the reason why I decided to do the writing that, that, that I did end up doing. And so I want to tell you what an honor it is, Jeff, and how much I've learned from you over many, many years. And of course I want to thank, and I'm not the only one, many of us, many of us. And uh, I of course want to thank the, the Park Foundation, the Park Center for Independent Media. And I want to start tonight with um, with um, a little story. I know a lot of the students here in the audience are really interested in the power of new media and social networking. And um, I, I, I have to start tonight with a very bizarre new media story. Um, which is that um, Jeff picked me up from the airport this, uh, this morning and um, we left the airport. I didn't have a bag. We got out quickly. We were about, I think, eight minutes away from the airport and my phone rang and it was my friend Jeremy Scahill. And I thought that Jeremy was calling me to threaten me to tell, because tell, I said, I'm going to tell embarrassing stories about you tomorrow at Ithaca yesterday. I, I, I emailed him because I knew he'd gotten the award and I am going to tell embarrassing stories about him. Um, so I thought he was calling to tell me not to, but in fact, this is why he was calling. He called, he said, you forgot your laptop on the US Airways flight. <laughs> now, listen, I know that Jeremy is a great investigative reporter, but this seemed to me just plain spooky. Um, so I asked, how the hell do you know that? But at the same time realized, oh yeah, I forgot my laptop. Where's my laptop? Um, and he said, Joan Walsh just tweeted, is Naomi Klein on Twitter? She left her laptop on her US Air flight to Ithaca. They're paging her at the airport. And as it turns out, Joan Walsh from Salon, um, who publishes um, the another Izzy Award winner, uh, um, Glenn Greenwald, um, she sent that out to her 11,000 followers on Twitter. So Jeff <laughs> pulled a U-turn very safely, very safely I might add, um, and I got my laptop and then Jeremy tweeted the success story <laughs> to all of his followers um, and one of them res responded, well if this experience doesn't get Naomi Klein on Twitter, nothing will. Um, I think it just might, you know, I've been resistant. Um, but I like this idea of, you know, millions of little birds picking up after me because I leave stuff all over the place. It's so useful. Um, I'm convinced. I really do, I, I want to thank um, the Park Center for for its fine judgment in, in deciding to honor Jeremy with this year's Izzy. Um, I will embarrass him a little. There's something really extraordinary about Jeremy, which is that, um, I don't think, I don't think anybody has ever assigned Jeremy Scahill a story. Um, he just, uh, he self, he is utterly self-assigning. <laughs> um, he decides what he's gonna gonna cover. He decides what the story is, and he sticks with it, and sticks with it, with an unbelievable relentlessness. And he really is a model for both the new kind of journalism, the best of what new media could represent and also this fantastic throwback to an earlier era of muckraking journalism that I.F. Stone represents. Um, so if I can reminisce a little bit, Jeremy and I have done lots of, of reporting together. Um, and I always remember when we were in New Orleans together right after Hurricane Katrina, we wrote um, a cover story for the nation. I wrote half and he wrote half. And the half that I wrote um, was about all of these mercenaries that had descended on New Orleans, and by mercenaries I mean the lobbyists who just came in while the city was still underwater with their wish list of policies, everything they had on the shelf that they hadn't been able to do without a disaster. And they kept talking about fresh starts and clean slates and they wanted you know, a tax-free, free enterprise zone and the Heritage Foundation was the sort of ground zero for all of this. And on my website I have this, the minutes from this extraordinary meeting when they listed their 32 free market solutions for Hurricane Katrina. And it was everything from privatized, don't rebuild the public schools, give parents vouchers that they can use in, in, in private schools more oil refineries, um, don't rebuild the public housing projects, uh, all of this. And you know, if you go through around New Orleans State, you can put a checklist next 
to almost every single one um, of the things on that list. And Jeremy was just zeroing in on the the real mercenaries, the the black the, the, the black waters, and these other private companies that just showed up in the chaos and were performing the role of the police. But of course, it wasn't in the public interest. They were protecting corporations. They were um, they were protecting developers. No one really knew what they were doing. And Jeremy was the first one to blow the whistle on that. And it was after that that Jeremy and I both decided to write our respective books. And we, we had this sort of un, uh, informal writing club where we would call each other um, really often and talk through the ideas because we always saw our two books, The Shock Doctrine and Blackwater, as being um, two sides of the same coin. That I, what I do in The Shock Doctrine is take this very wide lens on this political project that is really about privatizing every aspect of our lives. And what Jeremy does in Blackwater is just zero in, zoom in on this one company, but not just any company, really the final frontier. You know, Milton Friedman, um, the, you know, you knew his name was going to come up eventually. Um, the, uh, the, the guru of the so-called free market, and we always have to call it a so-called free market because it only exists in the textbooks. In, in the real world, it looks much more like corporatism or crony capitalism than anything resembling a free market. And of course, what Blackwater does is has nothing to do with the free market. They are feeding off of taxpayer funds and privatizing the profit and feeding off of the training of, of, of police and military and just privatizing it. So it's another version, of course, of what we saw with the bank bailouts, the private profits, socialized risks, socialized overhead. We see it again and again and again. Um, but even Milton Friedman, the guru himself, he said there are two roles for the state, that it can enforce contracts and it can protect borders, it can police. But of course his protege, Donald Rumsfeld, didn't believe that there should be any restrictions at all and even went, it went beyond his, his guru, his master. Um, and privatized so much of the US military, the final frontier. So that's what Blackwater represents in so many ways. And the response to Hurricane Katrina was so frightening because you know, a lot of people misrepresent the thesis of the shock doctrine as being this idea that there's something wrong with responding decisively to crisis. There's nothing wrong with responding decisively to crisis because so many of the crises that we face are clearly telling us loud and clear that something is wrong with the system, something badly needs to be fixed. And you see that so clearly with what happened in New Orleans, which was not a natural disaster. It was the collision of heavy weather, which is linked to climate change, the fact that we're seeing more and more increasingly intense hurricanes, and weak infrastructure. And this is where our future is going, where we're, we of course will have more of these so-called natural disasters and we will be less equipped to deal with them because we're coming off of 35 years of neglect of the public sphere because of this political project that has systematically waged war on everything public and collective. So then what do we do? Well, we privatize the response because, of course, the people who can afford it will always need protection, security, salvation. You know, at the end of the shock doctrine, I, I, I um, talk about this company that was formed just as I was finishing the book called HelpJet, which is a private airline in California that built itself as a luxury disaster uh, rescue, a charter airline that would fly you out of Florida I'd warn you when the hurricane was coming, and even book your vacation at a five-star resort for you. Um, so I don't know if HelpJet is still in business, but I really saw, thought we were seeing a glimpse of the future there with that, and I was very disturbed to learn that during the earthquake in Haiti, some of the only people who did get rescued were people who were working for Citibank. And Citibank had their own private rescue crew that came in with medical supplies and sat phones and saved their own people, but not their neighbors. And we saw this after the, but my book came out, it just kept getting worse. The California wildfires, the su summer after the book came out, suddenly we're hearing about private firefighters. Private firefighters, if you pay extra on your insurance, when they will come and spray fire retardant on your mansion. 
The company that was offering this service is a company called AIG. So I don't know what that means now because it's sort of, sort of all getting very confusing because they privatized disaster response, but then we kind of nationalized AIG. So I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure what's happening with that. Um, Better than anyone I know, you know, Jeremy shows how independent media can set the agenda and put an idea on the table and keep it there, really keep it there. But none of this happens without that extraordinary individual tenacity. But also, and I think this is really important to, stretch, to stress in this context, it doesn't happen without an amazingly rich, vibrant network of alternative independent media. Now, Jeremy and I are both supported by the Nation Institute, um, which provides us with resources, fact checkers, lawyers, researchers. Um, and, and it is important to remember that this kind of work, you know, d it, it, isn't, it isn't just sort of rattled off, off the top of one's head. I mean, if you're going to really change the agenda, you need to be airtight. With the shock doctrine, um, at certain points, I had five researchers working on that project. I'm very, very lucky to, to have had the resources to do that. And it was just because my first book um, was this sort of weird fluke success. So I was able to have advances that allowed me to, to hire this team of researchers because I don't have an institutional affiliation. And then there were four libel lawyers who vetted that, that book. Um, we were fairly obsessive, and my main researcher, uh, Deborah Levy, is a librarian, so I was incredibly lucky to have this sort of um, team behind me. Um, and of course, Jeremy and I write stories for the nation. I write for Harper's. We immediately go on Democracy Now! whenever we write something. Um, and we talk with another one of your Izzy Award winners, Amy Goodman, who amplifies the message far and wide. And you know, I'm a, a huge debt to, to Amy Goodman and, and the team at Democracy Now! for the fact that I have reached a non-alternative audience in the US. Um, the, the shock doctrine, when it first came out, didn't get any national broadcast media attention whatsoever. No NPR, nothing like that. I went on Democracy Now! and the book became a bestseller. That was it. Uh, and it was after that that the corporate media followed, shows like uh, Bill Maher, Colbert, things like that. It was after that. Um, so the reason why I'm stressing this is that sometimes when we talk about independent media, we talk about alternative media, we, 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 we posit it as, uh, as instead of engaging with the so-called mainstream media. I think it's different. I think that we are not talking about opting out of that discussion and only speaking to the choir, as they say. Um, but rather choosing the terms on which we enter that discussion, trying to have more control over those terms. And I think that's really crucial for, for, for both Jeremy and I, this idea of maintaining an independent and a critical voice, not being homogenized by the corporate culture that happens when you work in, in a mainstream media outlet. I've had that experience. I worked at a daily newspaper um, when I was out of college. And you know, I ultimately quit because I saw how it was changing me. I saw how the culture in the newsroom just gets under your skin. I mean, we're social animals. It necessarily changes us. But I think what we're seeing with this alternative network is that it's becoming more and more possible to have the resources to develop the ideas uh, independently and then do these kind of kamikaze missions um, into the corporate media, get in, get out. Um, but I, I also want to be clear that I am worried about the state of corporate journalism and the demise of, of, of daily newspapers. Um, because while it's true that independent journalism can smuggle ideas into the mainstream, it's also true that our independent journalism really does rely heavily on daily journalism. For me, particularly on the business press, um, where I think we see some of the best reporting. Because you know, my favorite publication is probably the Financial Times. Um, the Economist has also been really, really useful. And this is because you know, there is a market demand for reliable information for investors. I mean, th these, are, you know, if investors are going to sink their money in Uzbekistan, they want to know what is going on in Uzbekistan. Um, you know, in some cases, they may be paying extra for 
private research. But in a lot of cases, that's the way the business press sees their role. So you may have really wingy right-wing columnists and very ideological editors, but the sort of meat and potatoes reporters, um, I think, are held to a higher standard to some degree um, than, than other journalists. But it was really interesting when, when the shock doctrine came out um, and it was reviewed by a lot of these, um, these, the, these, these business newspapers. I was very lucky with the New York Times because to my complete surprise and everyone's surprise, they gave the review to Joseph Stiglitz. And I mean, when that happened, I just thought like, like I must be blessed, like this doesn't happen. You know, they would, normally they would give it to like Thomas Friedman or something, maybe he said no. Um, but what most of the mainstream papers did, particularly the business papers, is give the shock doctrine to be reviewed by the people whose worldview comes under intense fire in the shock doctrine. So, you know, disciples, fanatic disciples of Milton Friedman. Um, and this produced some rather vitriolic attacks, um, as many of the men, and they were, like, I checked, they were all men, <laughs> um, felt the need to defend the honor of their guru and so on. Now, my favorite one of these reviews was in the Financial Times. Um, it, was, uh, it was done by their business editor, their UK business editor, who's a man named John Willman. Um, he's a rabid free marketeer. He advocates for the privatization of the British, British healthcare system and tuition increases in the public school system in Britain. Um, and so, of course, you know, he called the book a screed or whatever it was. But what really bothered him was my footnotes, 60 pages of footnotes. He was very upset about this. Um, and here's what upset him most. He said, she even quotes the Financial Times when it suits her, <laughs> but not when it would be inconvenient. Now, of course, guilty as charged. Um, I actually quote the FT, I checked after this. Um, I, I quote the FT 26 times in the shock doctrine. Um, and I learned all kinds of things from the FT about the shock doctrine about this process of using disasters um, to push through the corporate wish list. And it, it, it was in the pages of the FT that I read an article in 1998 by Jeffrey Sachs talking about how the economic crisis in South Korea was being used by the International Monetary Fund to perform a kind of extreme country makeover on South Korea and push through all kinds of deregulation and privatization that had absolutely nothing to do with the financial crisis. It was purely opportunistic. Um, some months later, I read in the pages of the Financial Times about how Hurricane Mitch, a devastating hurricane that hit Central America in 1998, was being used by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to demand that uh, Guatemala and Honduras privatize their telephone and electricity and water companies. Um, so that's a really, that, that to me was a very, very glaring example of disaster capitalism that I never would have known about if the FT had not seen fit um, to tell their investor readers that there was an opportunity to be had um, in Central America. Um, they also were uh, cheerleaders early on of Paul Bremer's economic reforms in Iraq. They were very approving of the fact that when Paul Bremer arrived in Baghdad while the city was still on fire in 2003, he immediately introduced a set of economic reforms that, and this is a quote from the FT, make Iraq one of the most open economies in the developing world that go far beyond le legislation in many rich countries. I mean, that's a good quote, and that's why I put it in the shock doctrine. Um, so I have this um, unrequited love, you know, for the business press. <laughs> um, and uh, it does seem to drive them a little crazy that I use their research, and I, I want to stress that I, I value this research, um, to come to such radically different con conclusions than their editorial writers and their columnists. Um, I had um, a really funny experience. Jeff told me it was okay if I just told stories today. Um, uh, um, similar to this, uh, uh, when, when, when No Logo came out, and I, I know many of you probably haven't read No Logo. Um, no Logo was a little bit of an underground book in the United States. It was a bigger book outside this country. Um, but as you can probably guess, No Logo is, you know, it's, a, it's an anti-corporate book. Um, and it's a book about branding and how the, the um, this mania that gripped the corporate world in the 1990s that said that their role was to produce images, brands, marketing instead of products, 
had simultaneously devoured public space and ideas because of this new aggressive marketing and casualized so much of uh, so much labor because because companies were getting out of the production business. They only wanted to have contracts because they, didn't, they saw themselves as being in the ideas business, not in the manufacturing business. So they would just buy their products from a web of contractors, which created a system that was ripe for abuse. So the book was about that, but it was also about how that had created the context it had really created the conditions for a major backlash against the corporate world, against these mega corporations that were infiltrating so much of our lives, but giving us so little in terms of real commitment, in terms of um, steady work. So the, the kind of commitment that breeds lifelong loyalty, and, and as we remembered from our parents' generation. Um, so. The second half of No Logo is tracking the rise of anti-corporate activism, and I'll t talk a little bit more about that. But part of what I track is something called culture jamming, which some of you know what it is. Some of it's just ad jamming. It's um, there was a, a wave of this in the '90s, fueled by new technology, where young people were realizing that if they didn't like an ad, they could talk back to it. They could use all of these technologies to parody it and make fun of it and all of this. So I had I had a um, a, a chapter on culture jamming and. When I came up with the, the title for No Logo and the design for No Logo, I worked with a really terrific designer, I wanted the book itself to be a culture jam. So the cover of No Logo um, is a very sleek logo. It's an all black and then it's just a red and white logo, No Logo logo. Now I decided not to trademark it and unfortunately a clothing company now sells No Logo clothing and a <laughs> food company, but that's a, that's a whole other story. The issue is that The Economist, and I think this was very clever of them, a few months after the book came out, did a culture jam of no logos. So the front page of the, the front cover of The Economist was all black, and it said in the exact same font, pro logo, why brands are good for you. Um, so good for them. And, um, and, uh, and WNYC um, radio in New York, um, Brian Lair, decided that it would be fun to broadcast a debate, to have a, a public debate in a room like this um, between me and the author of that article, the author of that Economist article. And it, it was a good idea, but I was very stressed about it, um, about this public debate. And um, you know, it was early in my career as a public person. This is something that happens to writers, you know, being good at sitting in a room alone is very different than being good at speaking to rooms filled with people. <laughs> I'm still getting the hang of it. And um, so I, I, was, I, was, I was very stressed out and I was also stressed out because I had done some of these debates um, with right-wing economist types and what I found is that they were incredibly good at um, challenging any fact or statistic I use. Like I would use, I would use a statistic about poverty and they would say, where's your stat from? And I would say, the World Bank. They, oh, the World Bank, or oh, the UN, you know. So whatever I said, <laughs> they would just make it about that stat, right? Um, and you can always quibble about stats. So, so I had this inspiration. This is, you know, a few years back. I guess it's nine years back by now. And, um, and, and, and I, I decided, and this is why my researchers loathe me, um, I decided that I would debate this woman from The Economist using statistics and facts exclusively drawn from The Economist magazine. <laughs> um, and, um, but I mean, be really strict about it. Like, no word would leave my mouth during the entire debate that I would not attribute to The Economist. <laughs> um, and so my fantastic researchers came up with a whole stack of things for me to choose from, gems from the pages of The Economist that supported the thesis that there was a crisis in capitalism. It helped that the Enron scandal had happened in the interim. Um, and um, I'll tell you, I've never seen anything like the meltdown that took place on stage with, <laughs> with this. It actually, a night actually ended with her leaning over her microphone and going, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I don't care if it's in The Economist, you're still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it was a good moment. There aren't enough of them. But I recently had another one of these good, my, research, research brings me joy, and, and um, I had another one of these joyful research moments, um, I guess a month ago, when, um, when I, I got into something of a spat with, with the Wall Street Journal. Um, 
just two days after Chile was hit by that devastating earthquake, um, one of the Wall Street Journal's most um, charming columnists, Brett Stevens, informed his readers that there was one man to thank for the fact that um, more people were not killed in the quake in Chile, Milton Friedman. In fact, he went so far as to say, and this is a quote, that Milton Friedman's spirit was surely hovering protectively over Chile. <laughs> And he said, it's not by chance that Chileans were living in houses of brick and Haitians in houses of straw uh, when the wolf arrived to try to blow them down. Now, some of you who've read The Shock Doctrine know that I do write at length about how Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys um, did their extreme country makeover thing on Chile in the 70s. Um, and this, according to Brett Stevens in the Wall Street Journal, made Chile a prosperous nation with, and this is a quote, some of the strictest building codes in the world. Okay? So thank you, Milton Friedman, for bringing prosperity and strict building codes, unlike those backwards Haitians who won't listen to us. He didn't say that part, but that's what he meant. Um, he also took the opportunity to slam me in my book, which I believe he called a tedious screed, um, for failing to see the wonders bequeathed on Latin America by Milton Friedman and his friends. Um, now, I was quite disturbed to see Chile's tragedy being used to rehabilitate not just Milton Friedman, but Augusto Pinochet, I mean, the brutal dictator who had imposed these policies um, backed up with terror and torture. Um, and it seemed to me quite unseemly to be doing that in that moment. And it also struck me as an odd claim, this idea that Milton Friedman, who actually was on the record opposing building codes because he opposed regulations of all kinds, okay, that he could somehow be responsible for the fact that Chile had good building codes. So I did a little bit of digging, and this is where the research joy comes in. I got a hold of Chile's modern seismic building code, um, which was wisely drafted to resist earthquakes because they are in an earthquake zone. And I noticed that this law was adopted in 1972. Now, I think there are a few history buffs in the crowd. 1972 is a very meaningful year. It's a meaningful year because it is one year before that bloody coup in Chile that overthrew Salvador Allende and put in power Pinochet and the Chicago Boys. And what that means is that if one person deserves credit for the fact that Chile had these strong building codes, it was not Friedman, but Salvador Allende, Chile's democratically <laughs> elected socialist president. <laughs> Which of course makes a little bit more sense because socialists tend to like regulations. Um, so. I wrote a piece about, about uh, Chile's socialist rebar, trying to set the record straight, but the Wall Street Journal never saw fit to correct the record on this. Um, I, guess I, see, I guess I see all the work that I do in some way as an attempt to correct the, the record, attempt to, to correct the mainstream record. And I think a lot of us uh, working as independent journalists and analysts see our work in that way. Um, usually it's not just about correcting an error, usually it's about filling in some huge hole in the narrative um, that makes our understanding of the past and present incomplete in some very important ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what I mean by this concretely. And then in the discussion period, I, I'm hoping we can get more into some of the recent developments. But I just want to share a couple more stories with you. No Logo, as I said, is, was a, a book about the rise of anti-corporate activism. And it was based on the idea that this was pretty much inevitable, that you had a gen generation of young people that were dealing with governments that were constantly telling them that they couldn't do anything, that they were powerless, um, that they were essentially bought and paid for by corporations. And they were constantly pleading impetus in, impotence in the face of these amorphous forces like globalization. And so 
What I was seeing as a young reporter was that there was a new breed of young activists that understood this, accepted this, and was following the money. They were saying, okay, well, if our corporations say they can't do anything, then we're going to go to where the power is. And they were using the power of branding, kind of jujitsuing it back on itself. So I, I was writing about the student anti-sweatshop movement and using the kind of celebrity of brands like Nike to leverage better regulations um, in the garment sector, for instance. Um, or the way in which uh, Greenpeace was um, tar targeting Shell Oil because of human rights abuses in Nigeria and using their brand's celebrity um, as a tool in their human rights work. Um, and there are many examples of this. But I start the book with a quote from an Indonesian writer, and the quote is, you may not see things yet on the surface, but underground, it's already on fire. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, that's true in so many of these, of these moments, you know, when people claim they didn't see it coming. And, and, you know, this is really a choice because these pockets of anti-corporate resistance, whether it was culture jamming or the student anti-sweatshop movement, were largely being ignored by the mainstream press. And if they did get a blip, it was, it, there were no connections being made between these campaigns. And there was no attempt to identify any kind of a new ethos. So. This was the kind of go-go 90s. I was writing in the late 90s, so this was the height of the dot-com boom. And I came against a lot of resistance in the publishing world about the idea that there could actually be a new generation of politicized young people. And I always remember I had this meeting with a publisher in New York at a very, very large publisher. And she had read the book, and she, um, she wanted to meet with me. She said she really loved it. And what she said is, I, I, I really love books like this, and I really care about politics, I really care about international politics, my offices are close to the UN, I'm fascinated by it. She goes, but I have to tell you, people today want to read memoirs of eating disorders. <laughs> and I always, I just think that was so telling, you know, because it's the scapegoating of, 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 of the people. You know, me personally, I'm sophisticated. I love this stuff. But the people, you know, we have to feed them memoirs of eating disorders because that's what they want. Um, so the book was at the printer uh, when many of these pockets of resistance, many of these campaigns converged in Seattle. Washington um, during the protests against the World Trade Organization in November 1999. And I would sort of predicted this at the end of the book because we were starting to see already that convergence, but of course it was being entirely ignored by the mainstream press. So the, 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 the coverage of the Seattle protests before they happened um, was just utterly inane. I mean, you would have had no idea what was, drive, what, what was driving young people to come to Seattle. It was just all of this ridiculous stuff, completely uninformed commentary about anarchism, things like that, um, panic about broken windows. So but the day before the big protests were planned, I did something that I'd never done before. I called the New York Times op-ed page and I said, I would like to write an op-ed for you about the protests that are about to happen. Um, I'd like to write about what the protesters really want because um, you guys don't seem to know and I just finished writing a book about it so I'd like to explain it. And, and, I, and the reporter said, we already have a piece uh, running tomorrow um, about the WTO protests, thanks very much. I said, Who, who's writing it? And she said, Bill Gates. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, strike out. The next day, Seattle was a sea of bodies and tear gas. The city was entirely shut down. The World Trade meeting collapsed uh, because, yeah. And it was this amazing inside-outside pincer where you had this roar from the streets and really brave direct action. And it emboldened developing country governments who were being bullied by the US and the European Union to accept a deal that was not in their interest um, to stand up and say no deal and walked out. So it was an inside outside pincer, the kind of thing that really, really works. And later that afternoon, I got a call from the New York Times saying, do you still have that op-ed? Um, and um, that was the only time I've ever been published on the New York Times op-ed page. Um, so as you can see, my relationship with the mainstream media is a little bit confrontational. And um, 
it, I became a kind of a sort of spokesperson for this anti-corporate movement, and by the way, anti-globalization anti movement. And that phrase, anti-globalization, was an entirely a media creation. It was not at all what the movement called itself. It was anti-corporate, it was anti-capitalist, if you were on the radical side. But it was not anti-globalization because that means nothing. That is a completely meaningless phrase. Um, so, um, so we were attacked in all kinds of ways, much of it just distraction, you know, all the stuff about tactics, breaking windows, all that, not talking about the issues. But when we would finally have a debate about the issues, there would always be this attempt to change the discussion to, oh, okay, we know what you're against, but what are you for? What are you for? And so that was a way of, um, of just sort of saying, you know, you're not serious and we don't have to take this critique seriously unless you offer us your 10-point manifesto plan for um, an alternate universe, which we will then laugh at and deconstruct and use to dismiss you. Um, so, but, but what I was finding a, a couple of years in to this was that it, it was true that, th that, that the movement was largely a critique and, and, and it wasn't proposing alternatives. And so I, th I thought actually that it was a fair critique and, and I decided at that point, ra rather than writing a book about alternatives because I'm not a manifesto type and I'm not Lenin and you know, that I just can't quite pull that off, that, that it would be a better idea to show living alternatives, show examples of people living an alternative to capitalism and show that it could work. And, um, and I think that the world is filled with these stories and, and, and that in many ways what, um, what paralyzes us as progressives is, is in, I think particularly for people under 50, is in, in many ways that we don't know how political change really happens, the nitty gritty of how change happens. Particularly people who grew up in the age of the sort of video montage. You know, you just think, okay, there's a big march and the Vietnam War ends, you know? <laughs> and there's a big march and you have civil rights. And, you know, something happens and the Berlin Wall falls, right? I mean, how does, it, it, it's entirely mysterious, the work of organizing. And this is, of course, what the late, great Howard Zinn spent his entire life doing, which is demystifying <laughs> the organizing, the on-the-ground organizing that makes change happen. I always think it's so wonderful that in that film, the people speak, which I'm so happy Howard lived to see, lived to see the, the, this incredible tribute to his work, that you never once heard a politician speaking in people speak. It was only the people who spoke, and you'd see like footage of, 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 of FDR, but his mouth would move, but you wouldn't actually hear anything come out of it, and I thought that was such an interesting decision by the filmmakers. So. No, I don't, so my, my husband Avi Lewis, who's a filmmaker and works in television, we decided to make a documentary film that would just tell a simple story about how you can change your world. Not the world, but your world. Um, and we, ma we, we decided to do this at, um, at a time when Argentina was going through a very profound economic crisis. It was really a precursor to what we've just witnessed globally in 2001. Argentina, which had been held up as the model student for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, suddenly collapsed. And this glittering star in the globalization firmament that had all of the icons of the globalized world, Citibank, McDonald's, HSBC, suddenly just melted down. People couldn't get their money out of their bank accounts. They were attacking ATM machines with X-Acto knives. I mean, it was chaos. And Argentina went through five presidents in three weeks, and then there was this amazing thing that happened, which is people looked at each other and went, okay, well, if we don't like any of the politicians, the, the chant in the streets was, que se vayan todos, all of them must go. They realized, well, we're going to have to do it ourselves. And I mean, I'll never forget being in Buenos Aires in this period, because it was just the most extraordinary thing to be walking through the streets, and everywhere where there was light from a street lamp at night, there would be a group of 200 people having a meeting just using the light from the street lamp. And they would be saying, okay, so how can we buy groceries more economically and let's have a community garden and let's have a barter system with our, another neighborhood assembly. And also I think we should renounce our, our, the national debt. We shouldn't pay it. It's, you know, things like that. Um, but the other thing that was happening is that 
because of the economic crisis, factories were closing and people were losing their jobs by the thousands. Companies were deciding this isn't a profitable place in which to do business. And at 200 factories in Argentina, and this happened very quickly in a period of four months, 200 factories w which were going to be closed down were occupied by their workers who essentially unfired themselves. They said to the bosses, if you want to leave, you can leave, but we're keeping the machines and we are going to keep them working and we think we can make this work because we don't need huge profits. What we need are jobs, um, and we need goods and services for our communities, and we think we can do it. And w so it was an amazing thing to watch. By the way, every single one of these factories are still working. And so what we did with the take is we just followed three factories um, through their occupation. And one factory, we were there the day they broke the lock, went in for the very first time, had their first meeting inside the factory. We followed them through a whole bureaucratic process, the protests, the repression, finally getting a law that expropriated the factory and gave it to the workers. Um, because of course, they're debtors, they're creditors as well, they're owed back wages. Um, so I think that we have to remember that when we, when we talk about the role of, the, of independent media, that in so many ways it's more subversive to not tell the stories about how we always lose and how the corporations are all powerful, but to tell this much more dangerous story that sometimes we win, sometimes we win, and that it's difficult but not impossible. Um, and so that's, that's what we tried to do there. And when we showed the take, it came out in 2004, and we had this fantastic screening in Buenos Aires where we screened it on the side of one of the, um, of the occupied factories, the Brookman um, suit factory. Um, and people just sat in chairs on the streets and of course blocked the streets because it's Buenos Aires and you could do that without getting a permit. And, um, but when we showed the film in the US, you know, we got a very nice sort of art house reception. But in every conversation people would say, well that's, you know, oh those Latin Americans, they're so fantastic with their chants and all this and their music. But that could never happen here. Um, or they would say, you know, does, do, things, how, do things need to get that bad for something like this to happen here? And I never knew what to say because I hate that idea. Um, you know, th this idea that we, we have to wait till things get really, really bad before people can mobilize, because I think things are getting are already pretty bad. They're bad enough. And they were already bad enough, let me tell you, in 2004. But now what's starting to happen is that the take is getting this second life. And we were really excited when we got a phone call from the workers at the Republic Windows and Doors factory in Chicago and found out that when they occupied their factory in December, they had had a special screening of the take inside their factory. Um, and, um, and, you know, I always think, you know, that's, that, that, that the response to those workers, and those of you who don't remember, in, in, in December, um, workers at a factory producing windows and doors um, were given just a few days notice, I think three days notice, that they were all going to be fired right before Christmas. Um, and it turned out that it was happening because Bank of America had cut off the credit to their um, factory owner. And this was interesting because Bank of America at that point had received $25 billion in bailout funds ostensibly so that they could keep credit going <laughs> to small businesses. Um, later they would receive $45 billion. Um, and so these workers and their union were really smart because they made it about the bailout. You know, they said, you, you got bailed out, we got sold out, they took their protest to the doorstep of Bank of America, and the country was in such a state of rage over the injustice of this bailout that we saw this incredible solidarity and they were just overwhelmed. People were bringing them food all the time and offering to help and politicians were follow, falling over themselves to go and visit them. Obama was sending them messages of support and it really showed. You know, we, we, we're here all the time, you know, this is such an anti-labor country, they could never, you could never do that, people are too individualistic here. But really it was just that this story broke through and the story was told well and it resonated with people. Um, and it was just a little window, speaking of windows and doors. But, you know, to me, uh, the, thing, the other thing that was so crazy about it was here they are making um, 
a product that is so central to what Obama had just been elected promising, which is a new green deal that was going to include a huge weatherization program. And you know, you need windows and doors if that's going to work. So it just made absolutely no sense to watch this factory close. So in the end, because of their direct action, they kept the factory open. They found a buyer who saw an opportunity um, in Obama's uh, stimulus program to get some stimulus money and make this work. But you know, if we had it, an economic system that made any kind of sense whatsoever, then all of these different programs would be working together. And the banks that had been bailed out wouldn't just have been given the money in a blank check. There would be control over them and their funds would be directed precisely towards projects like this that are being described as national priorities. And no factory in this country would be closed until there was a green audit that was done. No factory would be closed until a green audit was done to find out what would need to happen to retrofit it, to make it part of a green energy revolution. And if it needed funds, well then the funds could come from some of those bailed out banks who had been given more money than they were worth on paper. That's what would happen in a sane economy. That's what a bottom up bailout would actually look like. But as we know, we didn't end up with a bottom up bailout. Um, and uh, the, the, the work that I, I did in the shock doctrine is also probably on a much larger scale, trying to be some kind of, of a corrective. And I, you know, I decided to tell stories here tonight a little more informally. I know a lot of you have read the book, so I'm not giving you the thesis you know, um, over and over again. But for those of you who read it, you know that what I'm trying to do is fill in these huge gaps in the official story that we have been told, this fairy tale version of history about how we ended up with this brutal deregulated form of capitalism that is so volatile, so profitable for the few and so very dangerous for the many. And we're told, and we have been told, that this economic model swept the world on the wings of democracy and freedom. That essentially we got it because we demanded it. We got it because we wanted it. And so what I do in the book is I look at the big bang moments of when this ideology advanced. And what you see is that the violence has been cleansed from the picture, has been cleansed from the story. We have been living with a victor's history. And so I go back and I look at how Margaret Thatcher used the Falklands War in order to resuscitate her political career. And as she came back from the Falklands War, she said, we fought the enemy without, and now we must fight the enemy within, who were the coal miners. And she broke that union and she broke all the others too. And so the reason why I do this study of how crisis and shock, whether it's wars, natural disasters, economic crisis, have been used systematically and knowingly and consciously by our elites to push through economic policies that they would not be able to push through otherwise, is because I believe that if we understand this, if we understand this core tactic that has been so central to the loss of our rights and our services and the connective tissue of our societies, then we will resist it the next time it comes around. Because this tactic relies on our disorientation. A state of shock is what happens to us when we lose our collective narrative, when we lose our collective bearings. If we have our own story, if we say, we're on to you, we know what you're doing, we know exactly what's happening, then we actually don't go into shock. It doesn't mean bad things don't happen, bad things happen. But just because bad things happen does not mean that we have to regress, become dependent, look to saviors and messiahs. We cannot do that. And it was, it was interesting because they put that up and there was an immediate pushback. Um, they immediately got all of this negative email and they took it down and they made it sound nicer but of course I think it was my friends at Democracy Now that got a screen grab of the original uh, Heritage Foundation um, opportunism and you know it's happening in, 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 in many other ways the, the attempts to use this crisis for the same kind of profiteering um, private security companies are already circling around Haiti uh, offering logistics and security in exchange for access to a 13 billion dollar reconstruction effort days after the quake 
the International Monetary uh, Fund announced that it would give Haiti a $100 million loan to help with the reconstruction, a loan, which would come with its usual conditions because what it did is it tacked on this loan to a loan that they already had given to Haiti, which called, had their conditions attached and it called for cuts in public sector salaries. So you think about this and this is just madness because of course we all have justice that Haiti was made so much more vulnerable to this quake because their public sector is missing in action because it doesn't have first responders, because it has been decimated by years of struggle like this. So they issue a loan to a heavily indebted country that has just been hit by this catastrophic quake, and it even comes with strings attached. But this time around, and I've never seen this in, in, in my studies of, of these types of moments, there was just an instant response. People named it, they understood it, and groups like Jubilee USA were organizing letter campaigns, attacking the International Monetary Fund for daring to issue this as a loan instead of a grant. And to my um, shock, there was a group that uh, formed self-organized called No Shock Doctrine for Haiti on Facebook. And within days, they had 40,000 members or something like that. Um, and they organized letter writing campaigns. By the end of the week, for the first time in anybody's memory, the International Monetary Fund announced that they would convert their loan to a grant. Um, so, you know, it does work when we call them on it, when we call them on the, on the opportunism. And of course it's only the beginning because Haiti needs much more than that. Haiti needs all of its debts erased and in fact, in my opinion, Haiti is owed massive reparations um, for years of abuse. Whether it's the Duvalier debts or that original debt that was imposed on Haiti in 1825 by the French um, who essentially imposed a tax that would be worth $21 billion today on Haiti for daring to be free. They brought an armada to Haiti which had liberated itself, the first successful slave revolt. And the French came back with warships and they said, if you don't pay us um, this amount, then we will re-enslave you. Um, we, want, we want to be paid back for the loss of our colony. Um, and that debt enslaved Haiti in debt for 122 years. So Haiti is owed reparations. It's not just a question of whether we, in our infinite generosity, will see fit to forgive Haiti. Um, the question is whether we are going to be able to resist this kind of crisis opportunism here in the United States. Because the economic crisis is ongoing, is already and very dramatically, as I'm sure you all know, being used to attack the last vestiges of the public sphere in this country. It is Katrina without the water across this country. And it's a huge irony because people did feel that they were doing something when they voted for Barack Obama, who promised that this was going to be a new era, a new kind of government that wouldn't give more and more to the people at the top and wait for it to trickle down to people below, that there would be a bottom-up bailout, as he said. So people mobilized and organized and spent a huge amount of their energy. So I don't think we can say that people have just been passive and watching this happen. Um, they poured their energy into an electoral strategy, um, and now we're seeing what we're actually getting. So yes, there is a stimulus program. Um, the problem is that because of that original decision to bail out the banks, no strings attached, rather than doing what would have made so much more sense, which is take control over the banks and force them to bail out workers and bail out homeowners and actually have a cohesive program that made sense and addressed our multiple crises, including and especially our, our ecological crisis. We had this top-down bailout and we have what you would expect, which is a public sector debt crisis. Essentially the crisis wasn't solved, it was moved. We took on the debts from the banks. We took on their crisis. Now they're fine and they're giving themselves massive bonuses. We all know we don't need to dwell on it. 
but the crisis has become a public sector crisis and the bill is coming due. So no matter how much Obama spends on stimulus, and even if there is some modicum of health reform, it is all being washed away by the tsunami of cuts that are happening at the state level. And where we see this most dramatically, of course, is California, which almost declared bankruptcy last year, had a $25 billion budget deficit. Um, a state run by actually somebody who's much more ideological than he likes to present himself these days. Arnold Schwarzenegger may have run as a centrist, but he is a hardcore Milton Friedman fanatic. He doesn't believe in public education. He's on record. I have clips of him saying, Milton Friedman changed my life. They think public schools are a socialist outpost in a capitalist economy. And lo and behold, in California, the crisis is being used to completely remake the public education system from top to bottom. Whether it means charter schools, K through 12, or whether it means a full-scale attack on the accessibility of the UC system, where students at Berkeley are facing 32% tuition increases, they're being told their libraries are going to close on weekends, but they're fighting back. We've seen some incredible actions. In fact, people are fighting, and, and what we see in California is that if you do fight back, you can win. I mean, one of the first things that Schwarzenegger did is he cut funding to uh, services for battered women. For, for, I mean, this is just incredible because we know in times of crisis and to, that are at times of economic stress that this is when women are most vulnerable to domestic abuse. And what a catastrophic time to make that decision. But feminists in California organized and fought back and they did get a reprieve on that. When I was at Berkeley a few months ago, they had just had a sit-in, or rather a study-in at the anthropology library because they were told that the library would now be closed on Saturdays. So the students went in on Friday night and they refused to leave. Um, and a few of their radical professors stayed with them and they had a study-in at the library and they stayed until the news came that in fact the libraries would sensibly stay open on Saturdays. Um, now, New York has not been spared, New York State, as you know, has not been spared these types of cuts. You're facing a $6.8 billion budget shortfall next year. The cuts are going to be hitting the most vulnerable. A billion dollar cut is being proposed to healthcare providers and programs, which are going to hit the so called social safety net hospitals. So when we talk about healthcare reform, we have to be talking about this too. Um, your friends attending public schools like CUNY and SUNY um, could be facing the largest tuition increases in those schools' history. They're also facing attacks on public transit. Um, the price of getting an education is going up dramatically. And right here in Ithaca, you have parents and teachers who need your support. They have got that their kids in public schools and they're seeing programs slashed and they're, you know, needs to be connections between private schools and public schools. You've got to get out of your silos. <laughs> and they're coming after Social Security yet again. You know, this is what I mean by the shock doctrine. The Bush administration tried to do this, if I recall. George Bush went on a listening tour across the country. He said he thinks it's a good idea to privatize Social Security and people said, shut up. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't pull it off because there's frankly too much opposition to it. And when that was before the crisis hit, when it became even more obvious what a disastrous idea it is to leave our pensions to be gambled on by Wall Street. But now there's a crisis. So rather than posing this as an, ide an ideological uh, uh, vision, it's an unfortunate necessity because of the crisis that has been offloaded onto the public sphere. And now there's an interesting intersection going on between this agenda, this attack on public, uh, on social security and Medicaid, and also the crisis that's going on in mainstream journalism and the slashing of re reportorial jobs. And I'll just give you one example. Am I okay for time, Jeff? I'm wrapping up. Um, a few uh, uh, months ago in January, there was a controversy because the Washington Post ran a big feature article about the looming crisis in the entitlement programs and how there had to be big cuts and it quoted all kinds of very impressive experts and statistics proving that because of the, but the debt and deficit crisis we've got to say goodbye to these entitlement programs. Um, 
And at the bottom of the, the feature, it wasn't an op-ed, it was a news piece. At the, at the bottom of it, it, it explained that this article was part of a New Washington Post partnership with the Fiscal News, which was described as an independent, uh, in, independent media and research outfit. Now, these partnerships are a way for daily newspapers that are slashing their, reportorial, their, 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 their reporters um, to fill their pages cheaply, um, even get content for free. It's not advertising, they're saying that this is, this is actually news. Now what they didn't reveal is that the fiscal, fiscal news was founded and funded by uh, Pete Peterson, the private equity billionaire who has for many years now been waging a one-man crusade, not one man because he's got, can hire whoever he wants to back him up, um, against so-called entitlement programs. And maybe you know the film IOUSA and all of this whole campaign, Pete Peterson has been underwriting. It is an obsession. And the article in question quoted um, as its main source the Concord Coalition, um, which is also funded by Peterson. And it cited data from another study, which was also funded by Peterson. So the whole thing, the article, um, the news agency, the fiscal news, the source for the, that they were quoting, and the statistics that they were quoting, it was all coming from the same billionaire. Um, so they, are lo they have lost the ideological argument. We all see the failures of deregulated capitalism, but the problem is they can buy the argument. And that's exactly what's happening, and it's being passed off as news, but luckily there was a huge backlash. Um, and this happened in January, and there hasn't, I've been searching the databases, and there hasn't been another piece published in the in Washington Post by the fiscal news. Um, so I think that out, outrage that, that they heard from the Netroots really, um, really paid off something to keep in mind. So the timing of all of this, you know, I said it in terms of the, the women's centers, but it's all of it. It's the attacks on public education, the attacks on care for the elderly, the attacks on after school programs. It is all coming at the worst possible moment because when people are losing jobs, when they're losing homes, that's precisely when you need these social services. And it is precisely at that moment when the net, frayed as it is, is being yanked from underneath people. So that is what we have seen in the past year. The wealthiest sector of society, shamelessly and unapologetically, demanding that the elderly give up their meager services, that children go to school without buses, high school students give up their dream of being able to attend a university like this one, so that the banks can go back to business as usual, bonuses at all and, and all. So why are people putting up with this in this country? Because this is not the case in other parts of the world. There are similar things happening in France. There are similar things happening in Greece. And the countries are on fire. People are in the streets. They're having general strikes. You know, pensioners are doing direct action in Athens. OK, the, you know, it's Greece. But they know, how to, they know how to have a protest there. But in the US, where it all began, where the injustices of the response are most acute, there hasn't been a response that is in any way commensurate with the injustice. So we know that part of it is because people do think that they did do something, that the elections were this kind of release valve. Everybody worked so hard, and then it was the give the guy a chance, right? Give the guy a chance here. That's what we've been in. Give him time. Wait, he's got a long game. I know his strategy. Just give him time. <laughs> um, so we have to admit um, that Obama has a particularly um, relaxing effect on, on the left, <laughs> on progressives. Um, but at the same time as he relaxes, that these times do not call for tentative action. They do not call for tentative citizens. They call for determined, engaged, and often enraged citizens. Because what we have seen is a transfer of wealth from the public sphere to the private sphere that is absolutely unprecedented in human history. And we're waiting, and we're looking, and that's not good enough. Now, you all know the story. You guys all know this story. The Ithaca crowd knows the story that FDR used to tell progressives who would come and meet him. That's a great idea. I think it's a fantastic plan. I agree with you. Now get out there and make me do it. <laughs> um, now, that is how 
how change happened. That's what Howard Zinn reminded us of over and over and over again. But with Obama, it's even more important because Obama prides himself on being a mediator and a centrist. This is a core part of his identity. We see this. He wants to look at the poles of the debate. And he wants to split the difference between them. The problem we have is obvious. The range of the debate that he, that he is facing, that he is mediating between, is far too narrow. It's these incredibly extreme attacks from the right. And his base basically sees their role as backing up whatever lousy deal he puts on the table. Okay, Maybe tweaking it just a little bit, right? We want a public option, please, right? Um, so he's splitting the, the difference. Um, and no, no wonder he's moving to the right, because that's what happens. If you start at the center, you're being pushed from the right, you're a centrist, where are you moving? Okay, You're moving to the right. So a few examples. Healthcare. On the Sarah Palin right, you have the shouts of socialism and death panels. On the left, you have progressives pushing for a public option in the bill. Obama splits the difference. What happens? Sacrifice the public option. So imagine if you had a large part of the movement that put Obama into power playing a very different role. Imagine if immediately after the election they had re declared their independence um, and built movements based on issues again. Because I think that this is what we have to do. The left in this country cannot be an arm of the Democratic Party. The left of this country has to be <laughs> principle based. We have to stop asking ourselves how this is going to affect the midterms. We have to ask ourselves, what do we believe? What are our core beliefs? What is just? And when we speak in the language of justice and morality, we galvanize and inspire people. And we also happen, as it happens, give Obama something to work with. So if there was a movement, a powerful movement, like the movement that brought Obama to power, that had been calling from day one for single-payer universal health care on the Canadian system, which actually works, then if Obama had had to split the difference, I don't think he, we, that, that you probably would have ended up with single-payer. But you sure as hell would have ended up with a robust public option that could have been expanded on, that could have been a model. This is not working. This model is not working. I think we're at risk of doing the same thing about the energy bill. Well, I know we're at risk of doing the same thing about the energy bill. We can talk more about that, I hope, um, in the question period. I was in Copenhagen. Um, and, um, you know, it was fun, but. The last night in Copenhagen, I just I saw so many young people who had worked their butts off for Obama during the election campaign and hadn't let themselves ima imagine that Obama could both understand the stakes, which he does, could both understand the science, not be a denialist, and also do what he did in Copenhagen, which is actually move us backwards. The Kyoto Protocol was a legally binding agreement that set emissions standards that had to be monitored. The plan that the Obama administration came to Copenhagen with is not legally binding. It tells all these countries, go off, set your own standards, we'll mush them all together, see what we come up with. What they actually come up with, and they've crunched the numbers. The UN has crunched the numbers. Oh, the UN. But the UN has crunched the numbers. And what that brings us to is, is temperature increases of four to five degrees, where we've been told that two degrees is too much, right? So this is completely unacceptable. And now the Obama administration thinks that the troops, that they, they can just galvanize the troops to defend their energy bill, which is a giveaway to so-called clean coal and is all about creating another bubble in carbon trading. And this is not going to wash. And I think that people do know this. So a little while after Obama was elected, I am, um, you know, I come up with these phrases, and I'm, as you can tell, I, I, I really, I'm a firm believer in, in naming things. That's what I tried to do with No Logo and, and, and with the Shock Doctrine, and I feel like when we have names for things, we're better equipped to deal with them. So I wrote this, I wrote this piece um, for the Huffington Post. Uh, I guess it was, I, I didn't wait very long, I'm afraid. It was, it was like three weeks after Obama was, was inaugurated. I called it the lexicon of disappointment. 
and um, it was it was if it was words to describe people's ambivalent emotions for, for this period and and maybe I was a little too early with it people weren't quite ready to um weren't, weren't went ready for the lexicon of disappointment but I think that they are now so I'll refresh your memory a few a few of the entries there was hope over which is like a hangover um, it comes from having you know you get a hope over if you, you've in, indulged in something um, that would have been fine in moderation but when there's large quantities of this type of prepackaged hope um, then you really you have a sugar crash afterwards um, so you know a sample sentence would be when I listened to Obama's economic speech my heart soared but then when I told a friend about his plans for the millions of layoffs and foreclosures I found myself saying nothing at all I've got a hope over there's Hoper Coaster which is the sort of up and down like wow he's closing Guantanamo no he's you know keeping Bush's uh, <laughs> policies alive and AFPAC and so on making them worse um, so you know that's the hoper coaster and we want to get off um, there's hope sick which is like homesick but this is for people who are intensely nostalgic about the campaign you know they they miss that sort of the simplicity of it and they just want to go back to to that they're, they're hope sick um, and they, they console themselves um, by watching YouTube videos of Michelle in her garden um, over and over and over again um, I like also like hope Hope break. It's like heartbreak, but you, you're like hope broken. Like I'm, you know, I'm just, I just feel hope broken about the whole thing, right? Um, but I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not anti hope. I, I'm a big hope fan. Um, I don't want a hope lash. You know, that would be, that would be terrible because movements, um, movements need a lot of things. We need clear goals. We need vision. We need a strategy to build power. But we also need hope. Hope is oxygen. We can achieve nothing without it. But I think the real issue is you know, where are we placing our hope? Where, where are we placing it? And I think the, 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 era, the era of placing our hope in the messianic man who's going to come in and fix everything for us has definitively passed. Um, we have to plant our seeds of hope, call it uh, the hope roots, um, in places where we can protect it, you know, where in our schools, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. Um, and, you know, when I was writing this column, I didn't want to get too down on hope, and I thought about Studs Terkel, another one of our great heroes who died so recently. Um, and Studs, one of his last books was called Hope Dies Last. And he was a real fan of hope. But he always put his hope in, in the hope roots. He put it in, in activists who were changing the world um, in their communities. And, and I picked up the book. And, and it ends on this great quote. It actually starts on this great quote. He says, Hope has never trickled down. It has always sprung up. And I think that's pretty much it. It's a fine slogan when rooting for a long shot presidential candidate, but as a posture towards the president of the most powerful nation on earth, hope is dangerously deferential. Our task is not to abandon hope, but to find more appropriate homes for it and to defend it with everything we've got. Thank you. If you're leaving, leave quietly. This is the time when people can participate. I'm looking at a room full of hope sick people <laughs> uh, suffering from ho hope overs. All right. It's a real treat to have a journalist, one of the most important in the world, being able to discuss her trials and tribulations, her mission, her worldview. This is the time that you participate. Here are the rules. 
Just uh, the Park Center for Independent Media believes that dissent is always patriotic. That's why we feature dissenting journalists. It's also patriotic when it comes from people in the audience. Everyone should treat each other with respect and make your comments. I'm open to comments or questions, but keep them short. Uh, and now I'm turning the floor over to our first commenter or questioner. Remember, I've, I'm going to be running a clock, but the floor is yours. What hope do you place in Clinton and Bush overseeing the reconstruction of Haiti? Um, none, zero. Um, I mean, the, other people have pointed it out. I'll say it again. I mean, it is, it is an outrage, I believe, that those two men were, 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 were entrusted with such a crucial mission. Um, you, Clinton, no, Clinton um, brokered Aristide's return to power um, in 1994. It was good that Aristide returned to power, but the way it was done was so incredibly coercive. Um, Haiti was still under dictatorship. The people were calling for uh, Aristide's return. Aristide desperately wanted to return. His country was in pain. Um, he was um, told that the only way he would he would be able to return was if he had the protection of the U.S. military because there was no police force in Haiti at that time. The military was still in the hands of the dictatorship. He would have gotten killed if he'd gone on his own. He needed protection. The Marines brought him back, but on a set of very clear conditions. He had to agree to a brutal, what's called a structural adjustment program. So everything that Aristide had stood for in terms of raising the minimum wage, in terms of the education and health overhaul, all the things that had inspired people, um, he had to renounce. And so he went back to Haiti. I interviewed Aristide about this in South Africa, where he's in exile now. Um, and he basically said, I had no choice. I mean, it was the only ter terms on which I could get back to my country. Um, but Aristide didn't play by the rules. And um, he didn't do everything that Washington wanted him to do when he was in power. Um, and then um, Haiti faced a brutal economic embargo, which continued through the Bush administration, who um, were then complicit in Aristide's kidnapping in 2004, a decade later. So to me, it was such an outrage to see those two men coming to save Haiti while Aristide is still in exile in South Africa. Um, hi, Naomi. My name is Randall Frank. I'm an information worker at Cornell University. Mm -hmm. um, as a student of economic neoliberalism, my interest was piqued by the shock doctrine broadly and more specifically about the social safety nets you spoke of, such as public schools and the continuous assault of privatization, the so-called charter schools. Another supposed social safety net that I think very few people think of that's currently under attack in this country, a huge domestic issue that no one ever heard of, is the family court. And particularly uh, around Clinton's Welfare Reform Act of 96 when the family court was uh, defunded in effect and um, thereafter it was funded through a system of dollar matching versus, um, based on the amount of support dollars that could be collected creating an unnatural and unholy profit incentive to disenfranchise millions of children from their human right to an equal connection with their so-called non-custodial parents. Um, so my question is, what do you think can be done to raise consciousness about this problem? And it's all around us. It's, it's really awful. Um, but yet, when I check um, progressive uh, journalistic groups, I get nothing. There's nothing. I can find out more about the family court watching Fox News, which is devastating to me. Do you, your response, please. Well, I have to admit that it's uh, that it's not an area that I've done any research into, so I'm I'm clearly part of the problem. Um, but um, you know, in terms of advice uh, in getting getting the story out there, I mean, I think it's just relentlessness, really. Uh, you know, starting you know where I ending where I began. That 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 this kind of work in terms of just getting an idea into the culture. Um, I, we do have more tools available to us than we used to. Um, and, you know, I think you need to pick journalists who you think might be most receptive and really um, 
present the case in as compelling a way as you can and do as much writing as you personally can um, you know instead of waiting for people to to write it you know do, do as much of the writing as you can lay it out as well as you can and just keep at it until you get somebody pique somebody's interest thank you so much and I really okay. enjoy your work thank you <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah, I'm a student here, and my question is, in the past few years we've seen the election of Obama, um, a worldwide economic crisis, and um, also increased um, technology and social networking and activism through that, those social, social networking sites. So in light of the past few years, what do you think is the fate or future of Friedman economics and neoliberalism after the economic crisis? Well, I think I think where it's heading is that the idea, the 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 ideology as such, is in crisis. I mean, it's not fun to be a Milton Friedman fanatic at the moment, um, but but that doesn't mean that the the policies are are gone. I mean, this is what I've been been arguing here tonight is that you you, you know during the Bush years they tried to sell. The, the privatization of social security on ideological grounds, that the private sector is m just more efficient, it's better, it's in, you know, in the same way that privatization is always sold. But now you have an economic crisis to hide behind and the very same players um, who, who don't just believe in it for ideological reasons, this is the point of somebody like P Peterson being the big defender, I mean this is, represents a huge boom for Wall Street, so no wonder this you know, private equity guru um, is interested in it, I mean this is, this is the next bubble. Um, and America demands another bubble, as the Onion said um, shortly after the economic crisis. Um, so, so I, you, you know, I, I always feel about Friedmanism or uh, Reaganism or whatever the ideology is that um, what we're really dealing with is a is a class war. Am I allowed to say that? A revolt of the elites. Um, it's really about the interests of very powerful people in our society um, who have been in a state of revolt really since, since the end of the Second World War. I mean it began with the New Deal but they were too scrambled by the depression and, and, and the fact that capitalism was, you know, had really taken a beating and everyone pretty much agreed that they had created, that, that, that the capitalists had created the Great Depression and this was a moment of you know, tremendous popularity for socialist ideas in this country. So there was this sort of fallow period. Um,